Okay, um, let's finish where we stopped last time due to the fire alarm. Um, we'll talk about um, we'll talk about masking and the remarkable fact that uh, of backward masking, which uh, means that you have a stimulus, and then let's see 50. You have a um, uh, it's an image for 30 milliseconds on. And then let's see, you can have, um, if immediately afterwards, for instance, you have a second image with lots of lines, lots of high contrast lines or random color patches or something like that, then the impression of the first image can be totally wiped away such that they erase from your mind, such that if you do it properly, you won't even see it at all in the, in the strongest case, that you can totally uh, remove the image from, uh, from visibility as if you never saw it. Now, in certain conditions, you can still show uh, priming in other words, um, that something in your brain did register the image, albeit not at a conscious level. And you can st show that statistically that the person will respond to something that was present in the image, although you know, the person claims that he didn't see the image. And this, this masking can go on up to 50, 60, 80, or up to 100 milliseconds afterwards. So that the one interpretation is, not the only one, but one of the interpretation is that you have some sort of either an integrator or a feedback system that integrates up the activity, that feeds back the activity over 50 to 80 milliseconds, and that's how the second image can interfere with the perception of the first image. You just there, there's some nice interesting illusions that I think are, are very, very useful to study the microstructure of consciousness to study the microphenomenology, both at the phenomenological level, in other words, at the level of what you see, at the level of phenomena, uh, what is it you see, as well as the detailed psychophysical time cost, and ultimately the, uh, the time cost of the underlying neurons and the, um, um, uh, for example, functional imaging on, um, on neurons. So this is an illusion that was found by my, Michael Herzog, who was a postdoc here in the lab uh, two years back, and is now uh, um, uh, in uh, Germany. So it's quite, a, it's quite a strong illusion. If you do it strongly, you have no idea what's going on. So the, uh, the, the, the main version, there are lots of different versions of this illusion now. We sort of made a, published eight different papers on this. Uh, so in the original version, you flash up. This is called a Vernier stimulus. It's, it's a stimulus where the upper bar is a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right of the lower bar. And you're exceedingly good. Your visual system is exceedingly good at telling whether this bar is to the left or to the upper uh, or to the right of the lower bar. You can do this with um, probably a 20th of the spacing of your photoreceptor. So you are, the performance in, in trained humans can be very, very strong. So you flash this up for 30 milliseconds. And then it's immediately followed. This image is removed. So this was done on an oscilloscope for precise timing. This image is removed and then this mask is called, uh, is flashed up. So this we call the, the prime and this is called the mask. Now uh, in, in random, in um, standard, for example, uh, backward masking, you would have sort of random lines uh, that flash up here instead of these ordered ones and you wouldn't see anything. If I just flash this and then immediately I flash a whole bunch of random lines, you wouldn't perceive anything. You would just see noise. Now here what you see, and it's a very powerful, very compelling perception. You see this. In other words, this grating is offset, and the direction of offset is given is determined by the direction of this of the prime here. So if the prime is here to the right, then you'll see the entire grating offset to the right. If it's to the left, you see it offset to the left. Now this distance here is not equivalent to the distance here. This distance here is larger than the distance here. I mean, this is not. I mean, this is not a scale drawing. But the idea is, I mean, there's this very strong effect that uh, you'll always see it in the right or on the left, depending on whether the vernier is like this or like this. So this is rather interesting because what you're doing here, you combine, your brain combines, uh, there are two discrete stimuli. So A, the brain doesn't see two discrete stimuli, it sees one stimulus. And B, it combines properties of both stimulus in, into this synthetic one. Uh, this stimulus uh, actually never existed out in the world. Only these two stimuli, physical stimuli, existed. Yet you meld, your, the brain melts, or this is why it's called inheritance. This grating inherits a property, or this prime inherits one of its properties, namely its offset from the, from the, from the preceding uh, stimulus. And, it, the, and this generalizes to different uh, dimensions. So for example, if you, instead of using this vernier, you use these gratings that are, the, these bars that are slightly oriented to the left or to the right, you see the same thing. And if you do it with motion, so if you flash up these bars first here, then here, then here, then here, then here, you see it move, then, um, then you'll also see the final percept move. So um, 
and there are lots of uh, subtle variation of this um, of this um, of this paradigm. So I think it's really it's extremely useful, and and we have a, there's a postdoc in the lab, Wei Jima, who's trying to study the um, sort of trying to understand from a from a point of view of dynamical system, from a point of view of neural networks, what is the nature of the dynamical system in your visual cortex that can give rise to these different phenomena, right? Uh, f so for, if we just had this thing without, if we just had the prime without the mask, you would see the prime. So it's not that this is so short that you don't see it. So with the, pri the, the prime by itself is visible, but here it interferes, but it interferes in this very funny way that it, that, you know, that you see this, but with that property superimposed, or you see this mask with that property superimposed. So it's, 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 it's non-trivial, and the nature of the underlying processing is non-trivial. <laughs> I like it because it's very simple. These stimulus are very simple. In principle, you can get an animal to do to train this, to get a monkey to discriminate them, and you can do in you know all sorts of different techniques. In Germany, they're doing TMS now. They're trying to interfere uh, with these, with uh, some of this perception by sort of blocking the bra by briefly shocking the brain with um, with uh, these brief magnetic pulses. So it's just it's one of many phenomena. I could have also shown uh, shown a bunch of other phenomena where a what you see is not what's out there, right? This is not out there. That's out there, and what you see is governed by it is still though governed by lawful uh, by lawful uh, phenomena that I think are very revealing about the underlying neural dynamics. Um, it's always less. It's probably I let me. See. It's probably like I don't know, 20% or 30% or something like that. So here we we did not work. I don't think we were, we pushed it all the way to the Vernier limit, which would be like three or four minutes minutes of arc. I don't think. At least we didn't do that here. He might have done it since then. I, I but I would suspect that as long as you can see this by itself separates, this also separates. So that's what I. That, that, I mean that would be my feeling. Yes. I mean, this distance here, yeah. it's not the same as this distance here. How do you measure that? Well, I mean, you, you can, you can um, uh, so here we give, um, we ask people to, um, we do it with, uh, with a comparison, and we ask people always to do the discrimination whether the, the, the grating is to the left or to the right. The, we, we, we ask people to do a two alternative false choice uh, threshold judgment. Speed of processing. So, so, um, so as I said here, if you flash up, and we know that from, and I showed you this uh, this math last time, you can flash up in in single image in a single frame, and you'll see it. So, what people, the, so this is what you see here. This is flash for single frame. Now, of course, it's on a Macintosh going through the LCD, so it's not, it it it's probably slower. But you can clearly see, you can all clearly recognize any of these images, right? You shouldn't have any trouble. Now, of course, that's an interesting point. If I ask you, for example, if I ask you, um, you know, um, is there a, a butterfly in here? You can all see that. But if I show you 100 of these images and I ask you, other, you know, ask you at the end, was there a butterfly in it? You have great difficulty doing that task. But that has to do with memory, not so much with perception. This task was used by Simon Thorpe in um, in France to try to get at the question: How fast is the visual system? So we know that a single exposure of 30 milliseconds or even less is sufficient to mediate uh, the, uh, seeing. The question is, how long does the brain take? Of course, from reaction time, I can tell you, you know, the reaction time uh, in a speeded trial where you push down the, where, you, where the finger is down on the switch and you have to lift it as soon as you see something, recognize it. So sort of some of the fastest time can be as well as, you know, as fast as 50 milliseconds. But that, of course, tells you. Um, uh, that tells you the entire duration, including you know the motor behavior. But so you want to get at the specific question: How long does the visual system take to de to to make this decision? Of, which is of course different from how long it does it uh, will it take you to develop consciousness for it. That's a much more tricky question. And right now, I really don't know. There isn't really any any good technique to get at that question. So here, what they did: they had these images, and then half the time. 
these images contain one or more animals, a butterfly or a lion or a pride of you know geese or something. And um, half the time there were no there were no um, animals. For example, there were vehicles or something. And they, it, it turned out it wasn't only this is not what I'm telling you now. It's not only true for ve for animals, also true for vehicles. So it's probably something general. And then they essentially they measured in this lab. They measured EG. They had a, a whole bunch of EG electrode, and they 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 looked at the difference uh, between having an animal and having not animal. Now, your performance on this task is almost close to ceiling. It's almost always perfect. Humans are incredibly good at this. And they showed this is not only true for trained subjects, but they can essentially take people off the street and put them in front of this monitor. This is something we all do natural. Presumably, this is something that, you know, that we learn in the first year of our life. And then they look at different electrodes. It turns out it doesn't really matter too much. And they always subtract, they, they subtract uh, the signals for example, here when you look at the animals versus non-animals or vehicles, when vehicles are targeted, when you have to push a button or release a button, when there's a car or a bus or a plane or something as compared to non-vehicles, etc. And what you can see that always here, there's a signal at around 150 milliseconds. This is always a different signal. So these are the individual signals. And you can see depending on where you record them, they go up or they go down, depending on, on on what, well, what part of the brain you're recording from. But here what they do, they always subtract at the same location. They subtract, for example, when animals are target versus non-target. And then they see here's roughly around 150, 160 milliseconds. Some process in the brain could discriminate an animal from a non-animal. Okay, now that's really very fast. Within 150 milliseconds. So that's 150 milliseconds it being flashed on the retina. So these are bright images. It's going to take you at least 30 milliseconds to get to the retina. By the time you're in V1, in primary visual cortex, probably 50 milliseconds. So you have on the order of 100 milliseconds to go from V1 all the way to wherever in the brain you make this decision that an animal is present or animal is not present. And these are, you know, very calm. These are natural images, eh? Right? The natural images, they're complicated. Colors, in fact, doesn't matter. They also show that, although colors make it much more vivid, you can also do the same with gray, uh, gray scale, and it's not slower. So, uh, and the animal, of course, it could be, you know, you're not being told it's always a cat. It could be, you know, one of a gazillion different animals. So it's really quite a remarkable performance, in particular if you compare it against the processing time, as I mentioned last time. Uh, so typical neurons, let's say, in cortex, you hit it with input, it probably takes five seconds to spike, and then by the time, you know, the next stage is reached, it's probably 10 seconds. So it's probably on the order of five to 10 seconds between stages. And so, you know, with 100 milliseconds between V1 and, let's say, infratemporal cortex, where this computation of fetal from gyrus is likely to happen, you've got 10, you know, 10 sort of cycles, 10 iterations. That's not a lot for, for taking this decision. So uh, it's really quite remarkable performance compared to conventional digital machines. Yeah, it didn't really matter where you recorded the signal from. That is that reflects the fact that uh, due to the skull, there's you know the the signal is quite attenuated and it's very difficult to do any sort of uh, specific pinpointing. Um, and this sort of I guess this sort of experiment would be very difficult to do in fMRI to try to see. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess you could subtract the, well, yeah, but that would be too slow, right? You could try doing, looking at the, the hemodynamic time course for animals and non-animals, and I, that just would be too slow. That's a trial with functional imaging. You're looking at the regulation of blood flow in response to increasing neuron firing, and that, that, that's nothing to do with the technology. That's just a fact of our human brains. They take, you know, blood flow is relatively sluggish and takes a few seconds to set in, so you really couldn't do this. Well, you could do it in, in an animal. So the bottom line is it's very fast, and this gives rise to theories. I won't talk, we'll talk about next year in vision class. This gives rise to theories that suggest that um, a lot of this recognition, at least for things like animals, has to be done in a completely feed-forward uh, wave of activity. What, what, what Crick and I call the net wave of activity. You have these neurons that race up. You've got the spike wave that races up the red, you know, the optic nerve into the LGN into V1. And then essentially you only have a single pass because by the time you hit fusiform gyrus, infratemporal cortex, where most of us think this, uh, this computation actually occurs, you know, you don't have time for more than one or maybe two or three iterations at most. So some people uh, sort of have now models based on this that, that suggest that at least these tasks can be done in a single uh, sweep of a single uh, um, uh, spike wave moving through the system. Now, as I mentioned, this is not to be confused with the time it takes to be conscious. It's not the same. We, don't know, we do not know right now how long it takes for you to be conscious of this. It might be a couple of hundred milliseconds later. Uh, so it, this might be evidence for some sort of zombie system that you do this unconsciously, and the conscious decision there was an animal present mom, um, might come later. It's very difficult to get at that. 
very difficult to get, to get at that experimentally. Yeah, this shows timing, but this is based in a monkey, so humans it's going to be a little bit um, different because the, uh, you know, the, the, everything is a little bit bigger. Um, but this is for a macaque monkey, the times, you know, the retina. This depends on very much on, on the brightness. Very dim stimuli are slower than very bright stimuli. But you can see here within 40, 60 milliseconds in V1, then infratemporal cortex where these high level object descriptions are stored, at least in a monkey, it's 100 milliseconds. And then, you know, you can, um, maybe there are special shortcuts that go directly from here, or you go from here to prefrontal, then motor cortex, and then down to the spinal cord to push the button or to release the lever. So it's a, it's a, it's a rather fast system. Yeah, let's skip that. Okay, that was just to finish off last week's lecture. So now today's lecture. Yeah, before I come to that, we, we looked at the homework, uh, homework four. Um, and the homework four, among others, were these short little essay questions from an article that we asked you to comment on. And we saw almost everybody made this mistake, which um, uh, either is, well, uh, which um, this mistake, so we ask you to distinguish, or this, in, this question asks you to distinguish content from consciousness, from consciousness per se. So, you know, it revolved around the question, is there, is there not a single brain area that can knock out consciousness? Now, consciousness per se, that is true. There are uh, very small lesions in, the, in a part of the thalamus called intralaminar nucleus that we discussed. It's in Chapter 5, if you want to read up, it, up on it again. In the intralaminar nucleus, um, uh, nuclei, there are a whole bunch of them in the thalamus or in the brainstem, the very small lesions uh, that can lead you, uh, that can make you... Um, Unconscious. You can be in coma, or you can be persistent, you know, uh, um, vegetative syndrome, or even persistent vegetative syndromes, like you know, a few ten thousand uh, Americans each year. Um, and then you are sort of, you know, at, at best you might have some diurnal rhythms left, some sleep-wake cycle, but you're for sure not conscious. So that's true that there are single, very small discrete lesions that enable that, or can disable consciousness. But if we look at the content of consciousness, which is what, what, what we are mainly interested in, the, the, the NCC, there's no specific one lesion that can knock out all, there, there's no one area, let's say, in cortex where all the different NCCs come together and such. If you knock out that area, you, 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 you wouldn't have any content of consciousness, although you would still be conscious. Now, it is true that for each individual per, uh, class of percepts, there might be such areas. So we talked about it for motion. It is true that, that in a few cases of patients who have lost motion area bilateral, this is bilateral represented, that relatively small lesion, comparatively small lesion, I mean the lesion might still be as big as my entire thumb or even somewhat larger, can lead to a specific loss only of one aspect of consciousness, like color consciousness or face consciousness or um, inability to perceive fear, but, but, not the but not generalized fear, but only the inability to read out, sorry, the inability to read out and experience fear in, in, in other people, in, if I'm looking at, at faces of people. So some of this loss of consciousness can be very, very specific. Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about today a little bit about the underlying neuronal basis for attention. So we, we mentioned attention. We, I showed you these, some of these illusions, some of them rather spectacular, that show that if you don't attend, you can be oblivious to large, not only to these little effects that slip through, like, you know, if I show you things for 100 milliseconds, but very dramatic things that you just look, you're looking straight at, you're concentrating on something else, you're attending to something else, and you totally miss them. In general, today we know that there are, um, uh, that there are, that there's a, we're beginning to understand the brain basis of this and that the underlying neurons are up and down modulated as a function of attention. And I think if you think about attention, it's extremely useful to keep a metaphor in mind, and I use the election metaphor, I really like that. So the idea is that the brain is, uh, you have all these neurons, and they're competing, for, um, they're, you know, they have excitation inhibition among them, they, comp sort of, they compete for, for, if you have, uh, they compete sort of for firing, if you want, for, for, the, uh, for the strongest response. And I believe that, that most of attention at the different stages in the brain can be understood as arising out of this competition when you have two or more stimuli present. 
When you only have a single stimulus present in the visual field, let's see a line or a bunch of moving, uh, you know, a, a, um, cloud of moving of moving dots or a single phase, then there isn't any competition because the, the, the I mean, uh, the neurons will respond only to the phase. There isn't anything else to respond to. But when you have two or more stimuli, like very often occurs, or usually occurs, when I look at out you, for example, there are all these faces and bodies and colors and body parts. And so if I look at you, particularly in the, my higher part of the brain, where the receptive fields are very large, then, you know, the neurons are going to be confused, as it were. What, what are they supposed to respond to? Some of the stimuli in their field by themselves might excite them. Some of the stimuli in their receptive field might inhibit them. So if they see all this together, you know, it's a mishmash, and they might not respond at all, or they might only respond very weakly. And so that's why you need, you, you, uh, and you need attention, and people have sort of tried to make this more formal the, the most popular model in the area in the field is called the bias competition, where you have this competition and you bias it from outside sources. And I think a good metaphor is the election metaphor. So if you look at a country like, like you know, a big democratic country like India or the U.S., you have these uh, coalitions. Well, you have, let's say, election for prime minister or for, for president, and you have to have these coalitions. These coalitions are dynamic. Of course, the time scale is very different. It's over the you know, time scale of weeks or months or years in the political system. It's at the millisecond level in the brain. And everybody has a vote. And um, there are very strange coalitions of convenience that might arise for short times, right? Depending on some piece of legislation or depending on the candidate, there are sort of people who usually might oppose each other. They they sort of uh, they they uh, they they um, their partners because they want to get a certain piece of legislation passed. And then you can have certain events enhance or reduce the visibility of a particular candidate. So you can think of that a little bit like attention. You can have, for example, outside money coming in that certainly certainly boosts the campaign, boosts the saliency, boosts the visibility of a candidate. You can have scandals or you know sex scandals or everything or anything else that sort of boosts sort of you can think whether it's top down or or, um, or bottom up attention. Ultimately, at any given point in time, you only have one winner. Now, for consciousness, it's probably not quite true. You can be conscious of a few things, not only at one, but maybe two or three things at a time, at least for short times. And so, I mean, the analogy doesn't quite hold water. But the idea is that you have this competition. Even if you win the competition, it doesn't mean you win for all the time. If it just wins, it means, you, it means you win till the next election, and then somebody else can come in. You also have timing effects in election. It's really a very rich metaphor. I really like it. And so the idea, just like attention, you attend to one thing, you're, you know, I'm attending to one of you, and then I shift my attention to somebody else, and that's, I have to understand how that happens in terms of these underlying collisions in my head that briefly coalesce for 100 to 200 milliseconds, and they give rise, when I look at somebody, what happens literally in your head, you have these neurons that fire, they have a, they, you know, they build up a collision, and a collision means they have, it's a whole bunch of neurons that fire, probably close together. They're probably mainly pyramidal cells and cortex, because they're probably mainly excitatory. They reinforce each other. That sort of um, um, makes these, um, these collisions sustaining, and they inhibit their competitors that represent other concepts, that represent, for example, in, you know, when I look at somebody, that represent the neighboring, the neighboring percept, and that's sort of inhibited. And these can be biased both by bottom-up, cues, as we are mentioning, by salient cues. You know, if you wear something very salient, that's going to make it easier to attend than if you wear something very dark. And they can also be biased by top-down cues, like, you know, that I, you know, I'm looking for a friend or I'm, I'm, I'm looking for somebody who's wearing red. Uh, so this just epitomizes the problem once again. So if you're looking at a scene like this, Right, so if, let's say in your V1, you have a small receptive field, in V2 it gets bigger, V4 it's bigger, and by the time you get to IT, infratemporal cortex, receptive field, a single receptive field can encompass my entire hemifield, or, or you know, often they can also cause. And so now if you think about, you know, if I'm just looking here to the, okay, so this person's looking at my, at my left ear, okay, so if, if there's a neuron that's tuned for the left ear and it just essentially in, incorporates the left ear, then it's going to fire. But, you know, well, what about now neuron in V2 or V4 in IT, you know, by the time here, it, you know, it, there's the optimum stimulus for itself, but there are all these other stimuli. So if there's somehow a mechanism that allows the, 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 the neuron sort of, for example, to shrink its receptor field just to find response to its optimal stimuli, or if it gets biased because it says, well, I'm looking for something that looks a little bit like an ear. But this is sort of, the, 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 this is, I think, one of the key problems why you need attention. The other is many people, so this is sort of a summary of many people's conception of the function of attention. One is, this is particularly due to Anne Triesman, you need attention to dynamically bind features that are not expressed at the single neuron level. That's, this relates to the binding problem. When you, when, you com when you have to combine in order to detect a target, you, you have to combine features that are not present at the single cell level, like green and horizontal, and you don't have a green and horizontal cell, that, that's what you need attention for. 
or then to resolve this competition among multiple objects with overlapping representation. But that's not the problem if you have a single object in an otherwise totally empty visual field, then you don't need attention. So some of the best at the moment, um, uh, uh, evidence from um, single cell studies, I'll first talk about single cells and a little bit of fMRI, comes from uh, somebody called Desimon, Bob Desimon, who was a large group at the NIH studying monkey vision. Here's the old classic paper from Science, uh, 1985, where they uh, recorded an area V4 and an area IT. I think this was V4, and they have uh, two stimuli. So this, these are both inside the receptive field, and you can see, well, this sort of, the, the, the inside box, the size of the receptor field, and there are two stimuli. There's either a horizontal bar, that's a preferred stimulus of this neuron, uh, and a vertical bar. That's a poor, uh, sorry, the vertical bar is the preferred stimulus for the cell, and the horizontal bar, the cell only responds poorly. And so here what you see, now you're both inside the receptor field, and you force a monkey to attend to the preferred stimulus. So the cell, so you know, imagine you're in this uh, scenario, you're now looking, let's say, a V4 cell, and there's a, both a horizontal and a vertical stimulus inside that receptor field. And if you attend, if the monkey is attending to the good, st the preferred stimulus of the cell, the cell will respond strongly. But if, if the monkey is attending to the sort of poor uh, stimulus for this particular neuron, the cell fires much less strongly. It has both, in both cases, the initial, uh, a strong initial response, but then it fires much much uh, weaker. So it is as if, conceptually, you can think a little bit, it, it's like the receptive field of the cell shrinks around the attended stimulus. Now, of course, you can ask the question, how do you define the receptive field? How come, why can't you just say, well, the receptive field is just this big? Well, because first of all, in the, if the monkey isn't attending, then the receptive field is much bigger. If the monkey isn't attending to anything in particular, the receptive field is much bigger. And you can put this, you can put the preferred stimulus over here, over there, over there, over there. So all of these parts of the receptor field, the, the monkey will, the cell will respond to the stimulus. It's just that if you add attention and somehow it biases the network that de facto the cell will only respond, this particular cell will only respond to its, if, if the monkey happens to attend to its preferred stimulus. And they, they call this bias competition, this uh, sort of the framework. It's not really a theory, but sort of a framework. And the idea is the following. That you have, let's say, a whole bunch of cells in D4 that code, let's say, for vertical, and you have a whole bunch of cells that code for, for horizontal. And when the monkey is told to attend, let's say, to horizontal, this is something the monkey has to do a task. Okay, it's in a short-term memory that's somewhere in prefrontal cortex. That's where the instruction for the experiments reside. You know, just like you. If we ask you to come down to the lab and do an experiment, you're going to push buttons, but somewhere in your head, you have to keep the instructions. So they're in prefrontal cortex, and the monkey knows it has to attend to, um, to, uh, to the vertical stimulus. And so then there's this bias signal that's generated somewhere, probably in prefrontal, that gets sent back, that somehow manages to bias to give a boost to the, to the cell, to the cell with this particular orientation, to all the vertical cells. How that happens, we really don't know. So now imagine, so now you have, you have these two populations, in the absence of any, of any other bias, they're roughly balanced. They're roughly as many vertical for horizontal to, to, to first approximation. And now by this top-down stimulus, you're biased. And, okay, so now, now let's look at these conditions. So here, we have this stimulus just by itself. And the cell by, by itself really fires very strongly to it. So it, by definition, it's a good stimulus. Um, this stimulus by itself, the cell hardly fires at all. It's not a, it's a poor stimulus, okay? So now I add, I have these scenarios, these three, where they're all three stimuli, all, both stimuli inside the receptor field. If the monkey attends somewhere else, somewhere outside, then essentially you're gonna get some sort of linear superposition between this response and this response, i.e., you know, some sort of linear position between this and this, which is somewhere here in the middle. It's just sort of, you know, you have two stimulus now, the, the neural network sort of fired it out among each other and they settle down somewhere in the middle. But now if, you're bi if the monkey is biased to look, uh, because it's been told to tend to its good stimulus, those neurons fire much strongly and so now the response to this stimulus is very close to the isolated case. Again, so you can think it's like a little bit, um, like this receptive field shrinks around this, this particular stimulus. Conversely, if the monkey is being told, okay, now you have to attend to this stimulus, which this cell doesn't respond very well, the neuron responds much less. Why? 
Well, again, remember, you have these two populations of neurons. The, the, these are, let's say, the, um, the vertical ones. These are the horizontal ones, okay? And now you, you, the brain, t t I mean, your prefrontal cortex tells you to look for this. So this is bias. So this stimuli now, these neuron populations fire somewhat stronger. It could be very subtle bias. But they somehow fire stronger. So in this competition now, they win. But now the monkey is being told to attend to this one. So this one is now stronger and suppresses this one. And therefore, the response of the, of the vertical cell by to attending uh, to the horizontal stimulus is very small. So at least it's a conceptual framework. It's not a quantitative theory, but it's a, this bias competition is a conceptual framework. How at, e how at every stage of the of 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 these very complicated neural networks, you have. Um, a whole bunch of biases, they come arise from bottom up and top down. Here they come mainly from top down because these stimuli by themselves are highly visible, right? There's two isolated bars and empty background. So they're both very visible. But now you have this top down background, uh, this top down uh, bias, and so they can influence the firing. Now you must imagine that this happens at multiple stages. This happens not only before, but evidence seems to suggest single cell evidence and physiology at least back as early as V2 and probably also in V1, although there, there's some discrepancy between the monkey physiology and the, the human uh, physiology. Uh, pretty much most stages of the brain, excluding the retina. There's no evidence for attentional modulation in the retina itself. There's basically no feedback back into the retina in, in, in mammals. And so that you have this sort of competition at multiple stages. Of course, after you cascade the three or four four or five times at the end, you know, the, 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 the idea is that this stimulus will not at all be represented if it's not attended, while the attended one will evoke a very strong firing. Yeah, and there's still lots of things that, that, that are being sort of, uh, it's a very active area of research. So for instance, what happens if you have a single stimulus? As I just said, if a single stimulus, there's no competition, right? You have a single stimulus, whether you attend or not attend, uh, you might argue there is no big effect on a on a single on a single stimulus. Um, now um, that's not quite true. Some people, at least, this is from the lab of Monzel, they find sort of some multiplicative effect that the neuron will respond with an increase in gain to if um, to an isolated stimulus if you attend to it, as compared to when you attend away from it. Let's see on the other side of the of the visual uh, of the of the visual field. So this might be the response, the firing rate, if you have sort of different oriented bars or motion in different direction, this might be the response without attention, and this is the, the response with attention. So some slight enhancement. So I, in other words, there's not only a competition, but also there might be a generalized gain control that the more you attend, the more you turn up the gain of your neurons corresponding to the attended stimulus. It makes sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, so some people have argued that essentially what they started shifts, it's akin to making a stimulus more, uh, more, more brighter. Right, so uh, increasing the firing rate of a neuron, increasing a gain, for the next neuron it looks like, for the next neuron it looks like, like, the, like the input just became brighter. So the idea is that when you attend to stimuli, uh, the stimulus you attend to are sort of more, uh, are more salient, are more brighter than the stimulus you don't attend to. Now, I don't think, I, when I last talked to him, I don't think anybody's directly tested that. Right? Do you, I don't know if you know this idea of them, of Monzel and, and uh, Bob, this, they, they changed the contrast, I beg your pardon? No, but has he tested psychophysically in humans? So he's done this in monkeys, but I don't think he's any, because it should lead to uh, specific predictions. It, I mean, they have, okay. I mean, here they have a very concrete prediction based on this physiology, right, that the firing rate actually goes up. And for the postsynaptic neon, you can argue this is like, you know, the, the contrast of that particular stimulus increased. Okay. Yeah, but does it? But but does it look? It doesn't really. It doesn't really look brighter. Yes. Well, at threshold, something you know, not detectable or detectable, so you can say, well, 
I see. So you're saying almost by definition. Okay, so you're saying at threshold it, it is almost like that, right? Because when you don't see it, you don't see it. And when you see it, it must have gotten brighter. Um, there's also, as I mentioned to you, so attention is a multifarious, it's a complex creature and um, corresponding to the fact that neuronal competition existed many, if not most, stages of the brain. And so you, uh, it manifests itself in different forms. You can attend to a particular location in space. Right? I can choose to look over here and attend to just this location. I can attend to particular objects. So you can attend to, in, you know, to, let's say, my entire torso or something. Or you can also attend to particular features. Uh, to things like color or motion, you know, that I'll attend. I know I'm looking for my for my daughter, and she wears red. So suddenly, red will look brighter. That red somehow stands up. And there's some nice uh, psychophysics um, 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 evidence and some single cell evidence. And some of the nicest one is very recently is due to the um, the work here of um, of Melissa. So I wanted to talk about that and to give you. Um, the feeling for an fMRI experiment in attention. So now we're going to switch from single cells to fMRI. Um, so this is uh, Melissa's PhD that she did at, um, at the SOC. So, um, so this is a human. This is a human brain, and here you can see the I guess the left side. You can see some of some of the topographic areas. V1, V2, V3, V3A, and MT. MT plus, it's just another name for the, the motion complex, and in monkeys it's called MT. These are all topographic areas, and you can map them out using, um, using a technique that I guess it was invented at, um, by, I guess, Stephen Engels and Gary Glover and these people at, at Stanford, uh, Jeff Boynton, these people at uh, Stanford. And essentially, the different ways you can do it, so you can, for example, take a wedge like this, and then you can slowly, so this is a nice stimulus, it activates neurons, and then you can slowly rotate it. It's called the rotating wedge. Or this is something similar where you have a ring, and the ring, you know, expands, and then goes, starts again at the center and expands. And essentially what you're doing now, so if you're doing this very slowly, you're activating neurons. Remember the, we asked you in the homework, remember the topographic representation, sort of, you know, um, of if, if I flatten out V1, I have this uh, sort of, a, it's the size of a credit card, and then here I have the, the fovea, and then sort of I have this logarithmic mapping in, in eccentricity with constant lines of, um, of, uh, of angle. And so essentially, you can, you can essentially look at that, you can directly visualize it by doing this sort of very slowly. You can see how you can march across, you know, if you expand slowly, you can march across the, the retina V1. And you can essentially track the phase relationship between the stimulus in, 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 in real space and the phase of the advancing hemodynamic activity, the wave of hemodynamic activity. That's essentially what you're doing. And then you can, you can also establish, okay, there's V1, and then you can, by, by switching those things, you can see where the borders between V1 and the next map, V2 and V3. So there's a standard technique that's now routinely used to imagine in the living brain directly not only the fact that those neurons respond to vision, but there's a topographic representation. Now, that doesn't work for these high-level areas like, like um, uh, before, particular IT, because there is no more to or almost no more topography. It's very, as I said, they have this very big receptive field, and it's very difficult to predict. So in V1, if you go, you know, if you move a couple of hundred microns uh, across a visual cortex in monkey, you're going to do some sort of systematic trajectory in real space. By the time you get to IT, that's not the case anymore. So that's why these, te these topographic techniques fail in high-level areas. But they reveal, I don't know, the current state of the art is probably like a dozen areas or something, or 10 areas. Hello, that's also topographic, isn't it? But that's it for topographic areas. So LO is not topographic, and MST, I guess, wouldn't be... Probably not anymore. Okay, there's LIP. Yeah. I don't know frontal eye fields. What is in that's that's topographic. So and and uh, these are of course overall very very similar. I mean these areas were first defined, with the possible exception of V1, V2. Of course these were defined physiologically first in in monkey. And so there are interesting debates now going, what exactly is the hom homologue between monkey and V1, particularly for some of the more high-level areas. 
Now let me see whether I get this together, her experiment. So she looked at the fact, this feature-based attention. So the claim is that when you're attending, let's see, to me because I'm moving to the, from, the, from your left to, to your right, then all other stimuli that move from left to right will also tend, you will also tend to uh, pay attention to them or they'll stand out as compared to stimuli that move in the opposite direction. Okay, so the idea is you're not only attending to me in space, but you're attending, let's say, to my mo if you're attending to my motion, all, all other motion that moves in that direction will be facilitated. So the way she did that, you, you fix it here, and then you have these circular apertures, and they're, uh, they're dots that move. Here, uh, they only move in one direction, while here they move in both directions. They sort of interdigitate clouds of dots that move up and then move down at the same time. So it's a little bit like, I mean, the stimulus sort of derived from these motion uh, coherent stimuli like you had to do in the, in the homework, like uh, Newsom and other people used. And here there's some sort of cue that tells you at fixation that tells you do you attend to the downward moving uh, d uh, dots or do you attend to the upward moving dots, okay? But physically you always have upward and downward here. So let's say for the sake of argument, this is downward, okay? And you're attending downward motion here, over here. And you have to do some sort of discrimination, uh, the speed discrimination to make sure, you know, because you want to make sure that people are actually attending there. So let's say this is downward. Well, so now you can compare um, the, the bold response to when this was downward, when this was, in other words, the same direction as the one you, direct, you attended here, as compared when here you were t told to attend to upward motion. Okay, you can compare the response uh, bold to when this direction is the same as the direction that you were told to attend to versus when it's different from the direction you were told to attend to, okay? So here nothing changes. Physically nothing changes at all about the stimulus in either case. It's just the instructions here that differ. Do you tend to upward or downward? And so you can compare the bold response to upward and downward motion. And so she has this um, long stimulus period. Again, this, so this is now, you know, we're, we're talking about a total different realm compared to monkey physiology. Right? So everything is very slow, unfortunately. Just that's because of the nature of the sluggish nature of the hemodynamics. And that's, of course, troubling because, you're, you know, you're looking at different things than, than action potential. But that's, on the other hand, you can do this in living normal human beings without, you know, doing without doing, uh, you know, uh, training a monkey for half a year. Anyhow, so 20, millisec 20 seconds, the person just attends here to up and 20 seconds down, 20 seconds up, etc. And then here, Melissa now plots sort of averaging and doing a lot of signal processing that I'm not telling you about. She plots sort of essentially the, uh, the, the bold signal. So the bold signal, bold stands for blood oxygenation level dependent contrast changes. So it's, well, it's the dominant, it's not the only, but it's the dominant a mass signal that people extract from magnetic resonance image, from functional magnetic resonance imaging. The different signals you can look at, and this is the dominant one, and it reflects a conglomerate of different things, of changes in the blood, how much blood rushes in, how much of that is oxygenated, and at what speed um, uh, does it rush in. Also, you know, the uh, uh, arteries can, can dilate, they can become smaller and larger as a function of demand. All of that is confounded in there. But essentially, you're exploiting the fact that in your head, you have this natural contrast agent, namely your blood. And um, the, the blood with and without oxygen, de uh, oxygenated blood, has slightly different um, uh, magnetic properties. It has different optical properties also, right? If you cut yourself, it's different if you cut an artery in a vein. Right? One looks a little bit more bluish than the other one. Likewise, uh, one is a slightly different diamagnetic than the other one. And now these are small signals. You can see here the, the, the signals, the changes is 0.1% here at peak. So these are very small signals. So that's why if you operate in a magnet, you have to try to remove all, you know, all artifacts. You want to, you know, you want to carefully monitor breathing and heart rate. You want to monitor uh, movement. So very often you get a bite bar or something. Put the person in cement. That usually doesn't work so well. Um, anyhow, so the, now what you can see here, this is the white periods are now, the 20 seconds white periods here is when the person well, so this is the, re the bold response to motion over here, right? The person always attended over here, but the white one is when the, st when the person attended here the same direction as the, the, this direction of motion, and we argued it was downward. So when the person here attended downward, then this is the white, and when the person here attended upward, then you get the gray. So you can clearly see the response over here is stronger when the person attended to the same direction of motion. That's the, that's the, uh, the that's the important implication. Now, one, I mean, the, the, you can read it out from the data. One implication is that this should actually stand out, that this stimulus, she didn't test this, at least 
yet, right? We haven't tested yet. That this stimulus will actually psychophysically stand out as compared to that threshold, as compared to when you're tending to the other direction of motion. Now, this is not only a peculiarity of um, color, it's uh, of motions also for color. So here's the same thing for color where you look in a different area that we think is involved, that people believe for various reasons certainly has color nuance and seems to be uh, selective for, for wavelengths uh, information. The same story is true for, for color. If you modulate color here, you have green and red. And so you ask, you, you know, you plot all the, the, the the period. So the white is the period when the person over here tended to red, which is the same as that, and the gray is when the person attended to green. And this shows the response, the bold response to this part of the visual, uh, to this stimulus. So you can see clearly when the person attended to red, then the response here is enhanced as compared to when the person attended to green. And this uh, enhancement is actually quite last. The enhancement can be, um, let's see, here, the enhancement can be actually, in, for example, for motion in area MT and for color in area V4. Well, here, the enhancement can be almost half as big as the, as the sensory signal itself. So the enhancement can be quite significant. So th this is just to give you a flavor that you can visualize the, the effect of attention now, not only at the single cell level in monkey, but also directly in humans. And what you see when you attend to certain things, sort of what you might naively expect, that the, that the neuronal representation for that, or the, if we are more careful, the hemodynamic representation that, of that in the brain becomes enhanced for that particular signal. In fact, there was just a paper that Patrick just sent me that, that, that sort of it goes even further and shows that you can show, uh, remember we talked about the spotlight of attention, the metaphor of a spotlight, that when I, you know, own, that, my, that my attention acts like a spotlight, it's dark and where the spotlight is lights up. So there are people now using functional imaging who say you can actually see the spotlight and you can also see a change that as you zoom in and concentrate sort of more, quote, computational resources at a smaller spot, this is a larger bold response compared when I zoom out and I tend to this, all of this um, part of the visual field, when I get a large uh, footprint, a bold footprint, but the overall amplitude of that footprint is much less. Sounds almost too good to be true. Okay, let me finish here. That's going to be a short lecture today. Um, yeah, I'm very unsatisfied, unsatisfied, so I'll be brief here. The, what is the, where is the, um, because we don't really know at the exact, at the neuron level, where's the source of these attentional biasing signals? And the source are many, many. And so here we run up against the problem that the brain is a highly networked system, which we often tend to forget in our enthusiasm. You know, we say, well, there's this motion area here and the color area here and the eye movement area over here and over here is the area that responds to scary faces. We tend to forget that partly we view the brain that way because, yes, we can show that this area responds strongly to scary faces and to happy faces. But that does not mean that it's most in fact, that does not mean that that's the only place in the brain where scary faces are processed or happy faces are processed. It just means the neurons there respond a little bit better to scary faces and to happy faces. And so it's, one always has to keep that in mind. It's, it's a you know, normal human tendency. We want to sort of you know, have boxes and have labels there. But in fact, a lot of this processing is done in many, many different parts of the brain. So you see that when you look in attentional bias, the attentional biases that originate here in the frontal eye field or in, in parts of prefrontal cortex, those are probably related to the task uh, I told you before, like attend to color, attend to faces, things like that. Then there are also low-level cues that originate from parts of the brain, the, the pulvina and posterior parietal cortex. And um, uh, so everybody has a fam their favorite area that they study, and we really don't, there really hasn't been a convergence yet to something much more specific than that. The, 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 one, the last thing I wanted to spend a few minutes on is a, is an, is a deficit in attention. There's a specific uh, uh, um, how do you call it? It's not a disease, a pathology. There's a specific pathology of attention. At least I think about it as a, as a pathology of attention, which is visual neglect. Well, which is hemi, okay, the correct term I guess is sensory hemi neglect. What do we mean by that? Well, let's see, the typical patient, neglect patient, would be somebody uh, whose uh, wife brings, him, uh, brings her husband into the neurologist 
the, because the, 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 the husband himself doesn't complain. He says, no, I can f uh, fine. I don't know what my wife's complaining. I can see everywhere and I can see fine. I don't have any trouble. But then she relates to the doctor how, you know, he, every time he parks the ga car in the garage, now he hits it on the left and he seems to sort of run into things on the, on, on the left side. And, and, you know, you can, you can look at these descriptions. There's sometimes these patients don't eat from the left side of the tray until you turn the tray around or they'll go into the female bathroom because it says woman and they don't re read the first W-O, they just see man. And there's sort of all sorts of sort of sometimes bizarre, sometimes amusing episodes um, um, uh, that, that, that tell you that there's something wrong with these people. But it's very pernicious. I mentioned this in one of my first lectures. It's not like they see nothing there. It's that they don't attend. It's a little bit difficult for me to imagine how the world looks to a patient like that. So if you had a patient, if you had a lesion, let's say in V1, let's say I have a right, I, I lack my right V1, then basically this will be sort of, there'll be, it'll be like this, essentially. There'll be nothing here. Right? Perceptually, it'll look like this, leaving aside blind side. But certainly from a phenomenological point of view, it'll just look black here. Well, I guess, no, it won't look like anything. It's just like the back of my head. But, but I know that, and so I can perfectly, well, you know, if, if I now, if I, you know, if I've done this once for a couple of days for, you know, to amuse myself, I ran around with a patch. It's a little bit disconcerting, but you get used to it, and, you know, you, just, you, know, you constantly do this. It, it's, it's not really a, it's such a big problem because you do have two eyes, fortunately. It's probably one reason you have two eyes. I think it's probably a big reason why you have two eyes rather than stereo. Um, now... Neglect, uh, neglect people don't have that. Neglect people, they claim they see, and they don't have any sort of, so there are different ways now, you can, there are different varieties. So in some people, actually, if you draw their attention to the stimulus, they can actually see it. So they have a variety called extinction, which might actually be a separate syndrome. So in some people, if there's nothing, let's see, there's an empty visual screen, and you put a, you know, you put, the doctor puts a finger there, the person can see it. And then now if the doctor will do this, then this will disappear. What happens now, there's competition between the stimulus, and this stimulus will sort of, um, will extinguish this, the, uh, this percept will extinguish this percept. Okay, so there are different ways, of course, you would expect because these lesions are in, in different parts of the brain, uh, you know, each person is, a, is their own unique history. Um, well, one way you test it, for example, a standard clinical way you test it, you do a clinical bisection test. So you ask people, you know, you have a bunch of random lines, and you ask people to bisect it. Now, a normal person will do this here, right? Now, a, a, a neglect person, you know, might do this. I don't know what he'll do there. So the idea is, you know, what, what to, to us this looks equal distance. Uh, sorry, to us this would look equal distance. To a neglect person, this will look the same distance. That's one way, for example. Um, now, we know it's not the original p uh, description of clinical uh, of neglect going back to the 19th century. thought this, this was something in retinal coordinates. This was a lesion in retinal coordinates. Oh, uh, okay, let me come to that. Um, so, 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 I mean, like my, if I lose my right V1, then, you know, I lose the left visual field. This is a bit more complicated. This is not in, ap this is not in retinal coordinates. It's sort of, it's where you attend to. Because you can show... Uh, people have done this sort of with drawings. I don't have them here, sort of where they had houses. You know, they had houses, and then they had, let's say, a house on, f on, on fire. And they, you can, for example, perfectly well attend to this. You can attend to this stimulus, and then you'll be, uh, perceptually, people will neglect this. Or you can attend just to the right half of this, and then people will perceptually neglect this. So it's not that they neglect everything on the left. It's sort of, it's, that's why people now think of it as an intentional pathology. That you that you that uh, somehow you've lost access to uh, attention has lost access to those parts of the brain that's represented, um, let's say to the left or to the right of attention. Most of these lesions occur in a structure called the interparietal uh, lobe. Although this is somewhat controversial now, there's a proposal by Hans Otto Carnot that involves. Um, uh, uh, a slightly different structure, but for the most part, the typical patient has a stroke on the left, in the left uh, posterior parietal, uh, uh, left inferior parietal lobe, and so. Oh, no wait, yeah, it's. I'm oh, sorry, it's right. It's a right. It's, it's sorry. It's in the right because on the left you have Wernicke's area. On the on on the right, the typical patient has a lesion on the right. Uh, um, interparietal lobe, as I, exactly as I, as I showed it there. 
On the left, you usually don't have this tongue, you don't usually get neglect. So there's an interesting asymmetry there between left and right. That, that's typical. It's not, it can, there's, it can be a large degree of variability, and as I said, it, it, the exact size still remains controversial, which is surprising because neglect is a relatively common phenomena. Um, people have made, for example, this classical uh, uh, experiment by Biziach in, um, in Italy, where he had people, uh, neglect patients, had uh, them in mental space ask, okay, there's this piazza, and there's uh, the cathedral of, where were they, Milan, I guess, right? And ask them to imagine you're standing on the steps of the cathedral, the church is behind you, you're looking out, tell me what's on the left and on your right. And then people have, have no, this is all in mental space. They have an inability to do that for the left. They can only describe things on the right. And then he said, okay, now you picture yourself, you're going down the piazza and you turn around, so now you're looking at the church, and now describe what you see. And now people were blind to the, blind to the thing they could previously imagine, the right side, but now they could only describe the left side that they were previously blind, uh, that were previously uh, neglected. So you can see, so this is all mental. In, in all, both cases, it was the people were just asked to imagine this. So you can see it really has nothing to do with, with, with visual input. It's all, about, it's all about internal representation, and it has to do with the internal reference system and where you attend to relative this, to this internal reference system, to the left or to the right. John Driver's done some of the nicest experiments there. So that's visual neglect. It's a very interesting, it's a very common affliction. Very often, fortunately, it's transient one. It'll go away or it'll become uh, less, it'll become less severe. Uh, but, but it is a quite a common um, uh, um, phenomena. And then, like I said, you have, we probably have to distinguish um, neglect and extinction. So like I said, in, in neglect, you would totally neglect this, even though there might be nothing else in my visual field. In extinction, if, uh, if, there's em if the visual field is empty, I can, I can see this. It's only if I put a second stimulus over here on the other side that's sort of very vivid that I can see this and then I then I then this stimulus essentially disappears. Yes. Um, yes. Now people again there is. There's quite, uh, some nice evidence. There is interesting unconscious processing going on in the neglected regions. And of course, this will depend on patient to patient. But you can show, there's a one very striking study also from Italy, where they showed a very strong priming effect. So remember, I mentioned priming at the beginning of lecture. So priming is when, you, when, you, when there's a stimulus that you don't see. You can get auditory priming or visual priming. You can get negative or positive priming. We usually talk, when people mean priming, usually it's positive priming. It's a bit like in, uh, what's it called, that advertising? Um, subliminal perception. I mean, that uh, subliminal perception is one instance of priming, although it's very weak, and all those urban legends that have grown around it, you know, all those myths with Coke and Pepsi, they're just not true, because usually you can measure priming in the lab, but it's rather weak. It's not like, you know, if I flash one frame of Coke, I'm going to go out Coke, 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 Coke. <laughs> It's just that if I go out in the lobby and there happens to be a Coke and a Pepsi and they're equally spaced, and I might be, you know, five percent more likely to go to a Coke machine than to a than to a Pepsi machine, given assuming all else is equal and I'm totally unbiased versus Pepsi and 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 Coke. So that's sort of the nature of these priming effects we're, we're talking about. They're relative, they're quite weak, and it's sort of this hysteria that that came in the 60s. Um, I mean, there are people trying to propose legislation to try to outlaw it. Um, um, so here what you get, for example, in, um, these are of course patients, these are not normal people. So let's see, the, this was done with images, and I remember the colorful images, they were like animals or vegetables or flowers. And so they put animals, they were put animals or vegetables in there, so these are people who had uh, neglect. They put these things in the blind, in the, okay, they had right stroke, so they put them in the left visual field and they couldn't see them, okay, because they're blind. They, 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 uh, sorry, they were not blind, they neglected them. Now I flash on, let's say, an, an animal or vegetable or a flower, and I have to press a button or say as quickly as I can, flower versus vegetable versus animal. Now if I put, if there's a vegetable in my, in my neglected hemisphere, I'm much quicker at saying there's a vegetable here than if I put an animal there. You can show that, reliable. Okay, so, so, so uh, once again, let's say my reaction time, if I just have a, a flash up a vegetable here, I don't remember the numbers, but let's say it's 500 milliseconds, then I put up um, a vegetable in, your, uh, in the hemisphere that these people neglect, so they, they don't see it at all, if you ask them. They just don't see it. 
Now they only take 450 milliseconds or 460 milliseconds. It's a very significant effect. As compared when I have a, let's say, uh, not a flower, but a, uh, it was flower versus vegetable. If I have a flower versus vegetable here. So in other words, something in the brain had to register that information. That information was not made consciously accessible, but it was sufficient to enable me to respond significantly faster. So that's a typical positive priming effect. Positive because, um, you know, it's, um, it, it reduces, it enhances processing. Um, and this is a, I mean, this is a, this is a well-controlled effect. It's strong. It's there. Um, then also fMRI. There was a study by Geraint Ries who did this when he showed in 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 extinction patients. So the nice thing with extinction patients, they give you an, a natural control. What you can do now in fMRI is the following: you put a stimulus here in the in the lesional in the uh, contralesional hemisphere. So my lesion is typically in the right uh, posterior parietal lobe. So let's see, I have extinction here. So if I put this stimulus here. It'll, I can see it, and you can measure a response. I put this stimulus here. I can see it. I get a response. I put both stimulus here. Now I don't see this anymore, because, like I said, this it sort of will will um, will perceptually suppress this, will will extinguish it. However, you can still show that there's, there's still a response to this perceptual suppress this perceptual invisible stimulus in my um, in my um, right fusiform gyrus, which is intact. Well, what is damaged in these patients is the uh, is a um, posterior parietal cortex, but not areas around the infratemporal um, uh, uh, infratemporal cortex. So you can show this response, albeit a weaker response, is still present, and that would probably explain some of those um, some of those uh, uh, priming effects. Now, one of the least known but most interesting of all patients, I find, because it's a patient with a beneficial lesion. This happens very rare. But usually, if you get a lesion, you're in bad shape. So this person was in Switzerland, was a Swiss guy, and had a classical lesion that's bad. He had a lesion in his right posterior parietal lobe, and was admitted to hospital. Got all the, had all the symptoms of well, I mean, you have all sorts of other symptoms like confusion, etc. But in particular, had classical neglect uh, uh, syndromes. Then in the clinic, he had a second minor stroke. On his, in his left side, but close to uh, in the frontal uh, frontal cortex, close to Broca, uh, he had some aphasia. He had some language difficulties from which he then recovered. What's remarkable is that his neglect symptoms just totally disappeared. I mean, that's it. so. With this one, I mean, overall he was worse off because now he also had this language deficit. So it's not something one should do on a regular basis. But 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 it is. But and there's some precedent in the animal literature for that. It's something known as the Sprague effect. What, what does this tell us? I think it's exceedingly important. I'm amazed that this patient is not sort of discussed everywhere. And most textbooks often um, are talking about neglect, neglect this patient. Um, that tells you that, the info, like I said, there's some animal precedent for this, some uh, precedent in the animal literature, that the information, that the suppressed information, and neglect information is probably still around somewhere in the brain. It's just not made accessible. You essentially have competition. Think of this saliency map. Remember this idea of, of this, this idea of a map that represents the saliency of the of the world. Well, and that's based on inhibition. That if you're over here, this is much more salient. Then attention will be drawn over to this location. So the idea is here that you have competition, but you can see that in extinction, this by itself is perfectly salient. But now you have a second stimulus here. This draws all the attention. And although this physically might still have the same representation in the brain, or some of the same representation, some of that information might still be present, as we can see in this patient, as, as we can see through the primary literature. That information is not made accessible anymore because you cannot attend. For some reason, you, you cannot attend to those parts of the, of the brain anymore. But the information is essentially still present. So people sort of think today about sort of these sorts of ideas. There's some people who are sort of st starting to make a formal models of this with respect to um, and to neglect. What's interesting for us that we care about consciousness is this con is this a question and this answer. Uh, that if you so in neglect you usually only have a stroke in one hemi in um, one um, interpital lobe, usually the right. Now what happens if you lack both? Now that's that's. Very rare. I thought I had this patient here. Um, yeah, here. This is very rare. It's my last slide. This is very rare. This is a form um, of uh, pathology that was first described by, I think, a Hungarian doctor called Balint, where you have a number of symptoms, but among other, you have sticky vision. 
you have, so it's very difficult for you to move your, uh, you move your eyes from one location to the other, and you only see the things that are inside your spotlight of attention. Typically, you will only see one or two things. So, um, and, and typically, and when you look, these patients are relatively rare, but they are described in the literature. They usually have um, lateralized, bilateral destruction of parts of most of the posterior parietal cortex. And so, like, I mean, it's really like, you know, this is really like the tunnel. I, I was arguing last week that even though you can attend, you can perfectly well attend to something, it's not that the rest of the world disappears. But in these people, that seems, if you look at their description, that seems to be what, what goes on, that they can only attend to one thing at a time, and everything else sort of just isn't there. I don't know whether it's black. It's probably just like the back of my head. It's just not there. And for them, it's difficult to move because they have the sticky vision. It's difficult to move. They move their eyes, but once they, they attend away, they can again only see one of the or one or a few things at the location where they're attending. Now, what this tells us that the posterior parietal cortex is necessary for spatial relationship because they don't know where things are. They're totally lost. They're lost in this, so the entire conscience sort of is reduced to this one thing, and they don't know whether you know it was to the left or to the right of the last fixation. They've lost all reference mark with respect to space, so they're in pretty bad shape. And this, fortunately, it happens very rare. Uh, but they can certainly see, they can certainly still see color and they can see texture and they can recognize things um, when, when they attend to that. So what, what it seems to suggest that the posterior parietal cortex is necessary for attention, for doing, you know, way, where you are in the visual field and where you're going and doing sort of, you know, reaching out and moving your eyes, all of that, you can do that with posterior parietal cortex. But I don't think it suggests that um, at all that, you, that, that you, you really need that in order to be conscious of anything. The, that part of processing probably is done in the in the um, in the ventral path in the inferior temporal cortex. Remember the we talked about the, the two pathways, the two visual streams originally in V1, one going from V1 to infratemporal cortex is called the the vent the ventral or the the what pathway or a vision for perception pathway, and then the other pathway that originates in V1 and goes to goes along here to posterior parietal is called the dorsal or the what pathway or the vision for action pathway. That this you need for action in order to move in order to attend, but you don't need it for 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 conscious vision really. That's what I conclude from these patients. Okay. So on Friday we'll talk about some of the nicest experiments that directly look at the neural correlate of consciousness using a rivalry and flash suppression and other bistable illusions.